was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met And I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide Yes, it was my turn Till I met
Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The ancient seal by heavy stone. Messiah stood in all.
Lord, we worship you this morning. Father, we're celebrating you. We're celebrating your resurrection this morning. Father, we're so grateful that you rose and that we're celebrating you today. Father, we want to praise you and thank you for that. Help us to remember you. Lord, we're just so thankful for that. We pray for the message today. We pray that if there's one here that's watching the service today, that they see you through all of this. They see you glorified and magnified. Lord, for endless days, we want to sing about you and lift your praises. And we want that to be evident. Lord, thank you for all that you've done for me. We ask this in your name. Tell you how 
whatever you see, whatever your eyes tell you has become of me. This is not, it's not the end. Oh, I am making all things new again. Good morning, Pauline Baptist Church. It's uh, good to be with you on this Easter Sunday. Uh, I know that we're gathering still with this uh, COVID-19 and we're gathering in our homes around our community right now. And again, so glad that you've jo chosen to join with us this Easter morning. And it has been a great week as we have been going through the Passion Week. I hope that you've joined with our pastors and our staff as we've gone through the, the events of Jesus' life the last week of his earthly ministry, and it really has been an amazing week. Our guys have done a great job of, of not only just sharing the events, but also giving some practical teaching from those events as well. And uh, so, so much has transpired in the life of Jesus during this uh, Passion Week and also in the life of his disciples as well that have led us really right up to this morning, uh, this first Easter morning. I want us to walk through the events of the day and experience the day that changed Everything and, and really, when I say that it was the day that changed everything, it, what I mean is this, it changed everything. Uh, there's nothing in the world or in all of eternity that is the same now because of what transpired on the day uh, of Easter, that first Easter morning. Uh, have you ever had those moments that are in your life that define you? Uh, those moments that are, are turning points in your life that, uh, that change everything, your trajectory in life, the, uh, your direction in life? Well, I've had those moments and I can remember several of those that uh, really are vivid memories to me. And, um, and I think that Jesus uh, this week of passion has had lots of those, but a couple of those for me, I, I was thinking about this. What about those uh, life-changing moments that in my life? Uh, one of them, I've shared this with you all several times before, if you've been with us for a while, uh, was the time that I, I committed myself to following the Lord and full-time ministry. I was in the National Guard, and I can remember very, very vividly uh, being at Officer's Candidate School and while I was there, just experiencing this moment of uh, kind of feeling a darkness and a aloneness. And I knew this, that just God wasn't in it. And I remember calling Kenya and saying, hey, this is not the right thing we need to do. I need to, uh, I need to not do this. I need to turn and follow the ministry path that God laid out for us. I can remember that as a turning point in my life. Another one is when uh, Kenya and I, I was a knucklehead for a while. And, and we broke up for about six months. And I can remember when Kenya, uh, graciously, uh, as I come crawling back, to her, took me back into her life, and I can also remember that moment at Hunker Haven uh, in Edinburgh, Indiana, when I got down on one knee and uh, proposed to Kenya, and she said, yes, it changed my life. All these moments, our calling to Kenya, Africa in 1999, just changed our life, the, the miscarriage that we had of our first pregnancy, and it was so devastating and so hurtful, but yet a change inside of us as our faith was in God and as he moved, and then also when we almost lost Josiah in the miscarriage, just all those moments uh, were turning points and big times that I look back to, and they're part of making me who I am today. And the events of Passion Week are filled with those kind of moments for the Lord Jesus as well as for the disciples. Uh, and really for those defining moments that, uh, that show who Jesus is and also those defining moments that uh, help them become who they are. But the one defining moment uh, that is bigger than all of them, I mean, that, that, that's, that none is more defining than this, than that resurrection Moment, And we're going to look at that as we go through uh, this morning's message. But the moment that Jesus' lifeless body was filled with life has been engraved, and I would say it this way, engraved on eternity. It is a moment, not just a small moment, but again, it changed everything in all the world. There will never be a moment that we do not look back at Easter. And when I, when I say that, I don't just mean in this lifetime, but for all of eternity, we'll always look back to this moment of the resurrection, that Sunday early morning, because it is the day that Jesus, he conquers not only death and the grave, but he conquers sin also for you and for me. And we realize this, that in that moment, 
that our sacrifice for our sin, the sacrifice that Jesus made on that crucifixion Sunday, that day, that resurrection is the moment it affirms that God accepted the sacrifice. And Philippians 2, 9 says this, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed him, speaking of Jesus, with a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what happens on Easter morning. It's that moment that it all comes together and Jesus proclaims a name that's higher than any other name. I wanted to preach this morning a message entitled The Triumphal Exit. You know, last week we talked about the triumphal entry, and I really wanted to preach the triumphal exit, uh, but it just, it just didn't kind of fit, although it would be very easy to preach that. It would be very easy to teach that. But when we look at the events of the Resurrection Sunday on earth, uh, they didn't have the pomp and circumstance that we had for the triumphal entry. We're going to see this as we walk through the day, and I do want to do that. We're going to just walk through the Scripture and let the scripture kind of tell us what happened on these days. We'll look at all the gospels and kind of bring them all together and just see what happened on that Easter morning. And again, I think you'll see very quickly that there really wasn't the pomp and the circumstance. So it'd be very difficult to take these events and just to show this immaculate and amazing story. But we're going to see the amazingness of it. Just kind of walk through it with me and I think you'll see why it would very be a little bit more difficult to preach the triumphal exit because it doesn't. Seems so triumphal, but we'll get there in just a few moments. Matthew chapter 28 is where we'll begin. And we're just going to again work through this Easter Sunday morning. Matthew 28, beginning verse number one. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, uh, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled away. It was very large. But when they went in, they did not find the body of Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, Two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. And ran to tell his disciples. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the, uh, to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while you were sleeping. And, and if it comes to the governor's ears, we will testify to him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanne and Mary the mother of James and the other women uh, with them who told these things to the apostles. And these words seemed to them as an idle tell. And they did not believe them. So Peter went out the, with the other disciple. We know this is John. And they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping, looked, stooping to look in and saw the linen clothes lying, or excuse me, linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the, the linen cloth laying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying or laying or lying, excuse me, with the linen cloth, but folded up. In the place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, 
Then Jesus begins after this moment, he begins to appear. In Luke cha- or John chapter 20, he appears to Mary Magdalene. And then in Matthew chapter 28, he appears to the uh, other women who had been there at the tomb that morning. And then Luke 24 tells us about Jesus appearing to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And then also appearing to Peter and the other ten uh, disciples as he appears in a room. So really, that is the whole day, just in a nutshell, and very quickly, just a couple of minutes there of walking through the entire day. Day's events. What a day Easter Day was. A day that was filled uh, with emotional highs and lows. It was, it was filled with a lot of mystery also, not just the highs and lows of the day, but a lot of mystery and a lot of different interpretations of the day. But let me, let me, can I just be honest a little bit about this day? It kind of feels, as we started the day of Easter, uh, it kind of feels a little uh, anticlimactic in one sense. Now, now stay with me because what are you talking about? Just, just stay with me. Just think about this moment. Uh, in one sense, again, it kind of feels anticlimactic because there have been so many high energy events this Passion Week. Uh, first of all, uh, the triumphal entry, the cleansing of the temple, uh, the betrayal, the, the Lord's Supper, the, the washing of the disciples' feet. So many of these intimate moments and interactions with Jesus. And then we come to Easter morning. Uh, we, we have to remind ourselves, though, that when we're reading this, that it's in real time. So we're reading it, looking back, saying, man, it was amazing, it was great. But as we're reading the story, though, these events are just unfolding. And the disciples uh, were really, I mean, to be honest, seemingly they weren't expecting anything to happen. They're in bed back at the house, and they're not really looking for anything to happen on Sunday morning. Really, they anticipated for it to be a day uh, of uh, a day of mourning, a day that the women were coming to the temple or to the tomb with the spices. They were planning for this to be a day of mourning. Now, Ben reminded us yesterday or uh, on Friday that 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 the. On Friday, what they did, or excuse me, while he was in the tomb, uh, what they did was this. They were, uh, the only ones who were serious about it were the soldiers and the religious folks. Remember what the religious leaders did? They said, we know that he said he was going to resurrect. We need to put a seal on this. We need to make sure that we kind of contain this. So they were more serious about the fact or the thought of the resurrection than the disciples ever were. And they definitely put a guard there and they were anticipating it. But but keep in mind, uh, for the rest of those in this narrative story or this Easter narrative, um, they weren't just thinking this was going to be a morning to say goodbye. It was a death of a friend or death of their teacher. It was not only that, it was a day that they were going to mourn the death of the Messiah, the death of this king that they thought was going to usher in a, a whole new kingdom. So really... For them, um, they weren't expecting anything to happen. The best way to look at the first Easter morning and the resurrection of Christ is to understand it more as a, what I would say, more, it had more of a crescendo effect. And what I mean by crescendo effect is it kind of starts as a small moment and it gets louder and it gets louder and it gets louder as the day goes on. Because the resurrection of Jesus, now, now just think with me, the resurrection of Jesus, <clears throat> the one moment in time, and it really it is, it's one moment in time when eternity passed Eternity present and eternity future all shook and everything changes and it's the starting point. And we will see in the story that that starting point begins to get more and more and more intense. But really the starting point itself, uh, that place when Jesus is resurrected, it seems to be a quiet event uh, the disciples, again, uh, they, they, they're going to be changed. It's going to define who they are. It's going to empower them. And ultimately, it's going to launch them into all the world. But let's go back to Easter morning. Because we looked at the Easter day. But let's go back to Easter morning. The, the crescendo of the resurrection story begins. Now think with me. It begins here. It begins quiet, unobtrusive, uh, unobtrusive and discreet. Because here's what happened. At some point in the darkness of Sunday, while the world was all sleeping, Jesus, who had laid down his life, who had died for the sins, he had absorbed all the wrath of God as he bore out his soul. He's there alone on the cross. All of that takes place. He's laid down his life. And here's what happens. At some point on the Easter or on that Sunday morning, at some point in the darkness, he took it up again. 
He took up his life. It, and listen, it, it builds, it builds, it builds, and here's where it climaxes. He took up his life. Just, just that simple and that amazing. Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus who said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus who said, no man takes my life for me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. The third day, Jesus takes up his life. Again, sitting up in that dark tomb, passing through the linen cloths, the 75 pounds of myrrh and aloe that was in his, on his body, not even disturbing the grave clothes. And then he, went, what, then he walks off into the night, unnoticed, undetected, without fanfare, Jesus is alive. You see, I think we kind of get this picture. There's this rattling, there's this shaking, and the stone rolls away, there's this big light, because we, we've watched all the Easter passions, and we make it this big moment, like a, it was fanfare, and there was, woo, and crazy. <laughs> but it really wasn't that way. The resurrection is a lot like, a lot more reminiscent to when Jesus was born, when God puts on flesh there in Bethlehem in a, in a manger with Mary and Joseph and the animals around and all that scene, so quiet and in a distant place, yet changing all the world. The same thing happens with the resurrection. There's not fanfare. Now, let me say on earth, I would say in heaven, there was rejoicing and there was a party going on. He's alive. And I think all that's true. But on earth, the story is very different. As Jesus resurrects, as he sits up, as he walks into the night, there's not a fanfare. There's not uh, a big shining light. It happens in a quiet moment, unnoticed, undisturbing. Because it isn't until dawning of the day that we come into our passage of Scripture that we read. At the dawning of the day, then the angel comes down. He rolls the stone away, not so that Jesus had come out. Jesus was already gone. He had already resurrected. He had already stepped out. He had already changed eternity. But yet he opened and rolls the stone away from the grave. Here's why. So that the world can begin to do what? So the world on the outside can begin to see inside that he was not there. This is when the crescendo begins. The event happens. It seems so tiny, so small, so quiet. And then the crescendo begins. As soon as that tomb opens and people begin to get a view inside. Because remember, it doesn't say the angel said, look inside. He's not here. He just opens a stone. And I'm telling you, as soon as that stone rolled away and they began to look inside, things begin to happen. And things begin to circulate. Now the change has already happened, but the news begins to spread like wildfire. The resurrection narrative, it really does surround, it does kind of center around two major themes. I'm just proposing this for my thoughts. Uh, two major themes that end with one conclusion. The two themes are seeing in the tomb and the linen cloths left behind that lead to one conclusion that everyone had, and that is this, the tomb is empty. That's the conclusion they all came to. Now, they had different ideas as to why and to how, but the resurrection narrative again centers on these two ideas with that one conclusion. When John wrote his account, and we read it, of the resurrection story, by the way, from an eyewitness perspective, and Brother Larry reminds us that John is the only one who didn't flee from Jesus. He's right there during the trial, right in the midst of all of it. He lets Peter come in, all that kind of, So John's been with Jesus through everything. He was there through the thick and thin. He was there at the cross and he comes to the grave. So John has this beautiful perspective of Jesus and he writes us in his account and he gives us something that's very interesting, something that is unique that will help us, I think, to fully appreciate that first Easter morning, but also... It has implications as to, as to why some people don't come to the proper conclusion to what happened that day. Because not everyone that sees the tomb 
sees it the same way. Notice with me what John says, and we're looking again in verse number, John chapter 20, verse 4, kind of zoom into one part of this story and, and gather some, uh, some teaching, some lessons from it. Uh, beginning in John 20, verse number 4, it says this. It says again, when John and Peter get to the tomb, both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. This is John outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, notice what he said. It says this, he saw the linen clothes lying there, or cloth, excuse me, lying there, and he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him. He busted up in there. Notice what he says. He saw, what did he see? He saw the linen clothes or cloth, cloth lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in the place by itself. Then the other disciple, John himself, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. What did he see? He saw and believed. So John used three, and again, this is just some details, but I love the details of the story. John gives us three different Greek words, three different thoughts uh, of seeing these linen cloths, that it, cloths, cloth, cloth or clothes, I, my tongue's tied up, uh, that explain why there's different conclusions drawn from the empty tomb both the first Easter and, I would submit to you this way, even every Easter following that. These three words, these three thoughts, these three ideas found here in John chapter 20. The first one is this. Notice with me. We're going to look at it on the screen for you. It said in verse number five, and stooping down, so John gets there. He's looking at the tomb. The tomb is empty. Jesus is gone. John gets there first, but he doesn't go in. It says that he, the word, it says he's stooping to look. He saw the linen cloth lying there. And the word here, saw, is the word blippo. And I may not, be, may not be pronouncing that right. You can look it up later. The word blippo, it means this, to glance, to casually look at. So when John first arrives, he gets to the tomb, the door is open. He glances down. He doesn't go in, but he sees the linen cloths and he steps back. Now, I don't know why he didn't go in. We don't really know. Maybe it was out of respect. Maybe it was out of fear of what he would find. But he just takes this quick glance uh, it was not hard, uh, not a hard look, not an investigation, but just a glance into the empty tomb, seeing the linen clothes lying there, and he stops. I wonder what was running through his mind. Was he trying to say, well, I have, what has happened? Is he trying to process it, but he just takes a, a very quick glance at it, not a deep look at it. But it goes on and says this in John 20, verse 6, then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, now, here's what he saw. He saw the linen clothes lie, lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. This second word that John uses, again, I think it's important in the narrative here. Uh, the word he, said, he uses for Saul, there is this word, theoreo, which means to view attentively, to observe like a spectator. So Peter gets to the tomb, and John's standing outside. He's glanced in, but he's standing outside. Peter busts up in there, which is what we expect from Peter, right? I mean, we know Peter. He's the guy that's rebuked Jesus. He's the guy that's intense. He busts up in there, and, he's, and he begins to look at the scene. He's, he's, he's like a spectator. He's looking at all and investigating in his mind, just kind of look. What happened here? What's going on here? Peter notices the entire scene. He sees the grave cloth lying there, and he also sees that the head cloth is not lying in the same. That it's laying down by itself, and there's a differentiation there. So he's processing this, and Peter notices more than what John did. But I don't think that he fully kind of put it all together, but notice the third word. And this is where it gets deeper that you can see where we're going with this, right? There's a glance, and there's a deeper look. But notice in John chapter 20, verse number 8. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and he believed. The word saw here is another word, adon, I don't know how to pronounce that one. Here's what it means though. It means to turn the eyes, the mind and the attention to something to inspect or to examine. This is more than just a look. It's more than just a, okay, I see what's laying there. But this is taking everything in and then processing it. What does this mean? What am I seeing? What, what is all of this looking? I, I see the, the linen cloths are lying there. And, and what does all of this mean? So John's look is a much deeper look. A much more investigative look. Uh, he saw much more than Peter did. But again, what did he see though? He saw exactly what Peter saw. 
He saw the linen cloth. He saw the head cloth. He saw that they were separated. And, and let, me, let me take you back a little bit in here. Keep in mind that this linen cloth, these linen cloths or this linen uh, that was laying there left behind by Jesus, um, it, was all, it wasn't all messed up. It wasn't strung all over uh, the tomb. It wasn't laying over on the edge. That's not the picture at all. Now, I've looked at a lot of pictures. Even I thought about putting some pictures on the screen, but there's a lot of different ideas. But I would submit to you that it was very distinct the way that that was laying there. That, By the way, the, the, sh the Shroud of Turin, bogus. But anyhow, you look that up. But anyhow, this, this what was lying there, notice with me in John chapter 19, verse number 39, will remind you what was wrapped on Jesus as he was brought down off of the cross. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, here's what they did. It says that they came, when Jesus died on the cross, they came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in a linen, in linen cloths with spices as it is for the burial custom of the Jews. Now here's, here's a picture. Now I don't want to be disrespectful, but here's the picture that I get. It was, sounds to me a lot like paper mache. Okay. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. It's just what it looks like. This myrrh was a powder and the aloes mixed together. It kind of made this paste. And as they're wrapping the body loosely, not like a mummy, like the Egyptians, but a loose wrapping, they're putting these spices on each layer. These, uh, this aroma that was coming out to cover and mask the, the stench of death, but they're wrapping him up in this. So 75 pounds of this stuff. So this wrapping in this, this grave linens, there's a lot there. But here's what happens when John goes in. I get the picture of like a paper mache. I don't know if it, if it dried like paper mache or not, but I'm simply saying this, that it was in the form of Jesus' body. And when they walked in and John saw that, it was more than just, huh, it looks like somebody cut him out of that. No, it didn't look like that. Here's what I think it looked like. I think it left behind a cocoon. John, as he's looking at it, he's investigating it, and he sees that there's this head cloth that's laying off to the side. Now, I don't get the picture, by the way, that this word folded up, the King James and some other translators, I don't think they did a very good job on that. It wasn't the idea that he, he folded it up and laid it there so they would find it. That's not the picture. What it is is it was laying there in its place. I'm telling you, when Jesus just sat up, because the, the glorified and resurrected body of Christ, we know for a fact it can walk through walls. It can just appear because he's just a few, uh, a few chapters later, a few verses later, we're going to see that Jesus, he's going to appear right in the middle of the 11. He's just there. And they're like, oh, there he is. So his, this glorified body is a lot different than a regular body. And so Jesus resurrects. And when, when John goes in, he looks, he says, there's no way, there's no way they got his body out of there. Something miraculous happened. And I'm telling you what John, as he pieced it together, as he investigated, as he's looking at it, he says, it's true. He's, he's alive and he believes. And I don't have any doubts. And I think that John, as he writes his gospel, that's why I took a glance at it. I, Peter investigated a little bit. Listen, I looked at it and I was convinced that something miraculous had happened. Not because of the testimony of anybody else. But by what he saw, this wasn't a, a, a crime scene. This was a miracle. Jesus had been resurrected. And what caused him to come to that conclusion? Those graves linens, those clothing that were left behind. Everybody that was at the tomb had the same understanding. Except for John saw something. A deep look and an investigation. And John believed. Hey, what a turning point in the life of John, who was the first recorded person or first recorded disciple that believed that Jesus has resurrected. And I would say this, the death, the burial, and the what? Resurrection. That's the gospel. And John, the beloved, the one who's been with Jesus all the way. At this moment, he believes. He's alive. Now, he doesn't yell and doesn't proclaim, but I, he believes, and we're going to see him later do some other things, but it changed John's life. John was the youngest of the disciples from what we know in history and lived, he was the last disciple to live. We know the, the writings of John from the book of Revelation and all that got, John got to see and got to experience. And I can't help but believe that there was something special about John in his faith and his love of the Lord Jesus from his writings and from how God used him. But for sure this, this 
Where was the turning point? I'm telling you the turning point is this moment. If John had stopped with his glance at the empty tomb, he would, have not ha- would not have understood what was going on in the tomb, empty tomb. If John had just looked and saw the facts of the tomb and been a spectator, just kind of acknowledged what had happened, uh, it would have been just for a loss and John would not have been changed. But John examines, he investigates, and he comes to the conclusion that Jesus had resurrected. Resurrected, it's the only logical explanation for someone looking at the scene. Everyone that was at the tomb that day or came to the tomb or heard about the story, they came to the same conclusion about the tomb. And that was it, that it was empty. The women had testified it, uh, testified that the tomb was empty. The soldiers testified that the tomb was empty. Peter, John testified uh, of an empty tomb. The grave clothes testify of an empty tomb. The Sanhedrin, they testify of an empty tomb. Where is Jesus is the question. How you see the empty tomb will determine how you answer that question and it also will determine your eternity and your course of life. You see, Easter is more than just a celebration. It's more than just something we, we put on the calendar. It's a moment. It represents a time when everything changes. Our lives can never be the same based on how we answer, how we see the empty tomb. You see, John, he saw and believed that Jesus had resurrected. I think the question that I would ask is how do you see the tomb of Jesus? Not just the tomb, but the empty tomb of Jesus. For me, I can say this, I believe. And not from a casual glance, and not even as a spectator is looking at it and saying, okay, it's a fact, it's a historical fact. But I would say for me, I believe because of investigation. I would encourage you, you may not be a believer. You may be just watching the service and just saying, well, I'm here with my family. This is what we do on Easter. I would encourage you to investigate Jesus, his claims, the life that he lived, the miracles that he did, the way that he's changed the world and the way he continues to change the world, and yes, investigate the resurrection, Jesus is alive. And my belief in him, and my belief in him, and this is honest truth, is the single most powerful moment in my life that has changed my life and my eternity. It set me on a path and a passion If Jesus was still dead, then there's no reason to put our life and center around him. But he's not dead. He's still alive. When we say that Jesus died and he he had an earthly ministry, he still has a ministry today because the tomb is empty. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and for my sins. And he rose again so that all of us might have life. Peter describes Jesus, and I love it in Acts chapter 2, describes Jesus as the author of life. Jesus wants to begin a story of life in every individual. Every man, woman, boy, and girl. Why not come to the tomb, the empty tomb, this Easter, and believe? Not mindlessly, Not just a glance, not just a fact of history, but consider Jesus, what he's done for you, what he wants to do for you, what he wants to do in your life, and that is to bring life. And he has proven not only that he can do it in this life, but also in the life to come. He is the resurrection. He is the life. And in him is life. Father, we bow before you. God, we're so grateful for this day of days. There is no greater day to celebrate than that of the resurrection of Jesus. We are so thankful for the cross. We're so thankful that Jesus died for us, that he took the wrath of our sins. But God, without the resurrection, there would be no hope. Without the resurrection, we would would not know, did you accept it? Did you you accept his sacrifice for us? But because of the resurrection, we know 
emphatically, without question. You accepted it, and now you've lifted Jesus with a name above every name. And oh God, may we do the same because of his resurrection. Because the life that he has, we know this. We have life in him. And we celebrate today. We see the empty tomb. And for many of us, we believe. Father, I pray for those that may be watching now. They've just glanced at Jesus. They've not. They've just glanced at this Easter celebration. Just a, just a quick passing view. God, help grab their attention. They would take a deep and Lord, for those that have kind of just looked at the resurrection and history and all that as just an event, as a spectator, oh God, how I pray that your spirit would take them deeper. And Lord, they would experience the power of the resurrection. What a quiet night in the darkness of the tomb when Jesus takes back up his life. Oh well, Lord, that day, there may not have been celebration, we celebrate it now with joy in our hearts and thankfulness. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we would like to thank you for uh, joining us for another week of online worship. We hope that you and your family are making the most of this unique Easter weekend. We would like to encourage you that if you have any questions about baptism, salvation, church membership, uh, you just have a prayer request or just want to talk to a pastor um, to reach out to one of us this week, uh, you can text or call. Um, we would also like uh, to thank you for continuing to faithfully give um, and through your tithes and offerings. We ask you to keep doing what you're doing um, and continue to trust God through this whole process. Again, thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.